Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging Series, where we explore the lived experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Individuals who have shared their stories of how they gained their sense of identity and sense of belonging. I do say this every week and every week I am proved to be right. We've got a very special guest. Um, our guest this week is Rachel, oh, sorry, Quinlan. So Rachel, I spelled your name wrong, I apologize. Um, Rachel Quinlan, um, and she is, uh, I've spelled it right on this one, sorry. <laughs> right, she's a research nurse and um, midwife in, well, she was in the Department of Infectious Diseases. And, you know, because it's Black History Month, I like to think about reclaiming narratives. And I know Rachel is very big on reclaiming and claiming her narrative. So I'm, I'm going to start by asking my usual first question, which is, can you tell me what it was? Tell me what it is that gave you your sense of identity, gave you your sense of belonging as you were growing up? Sure. First of all, I'd like to say thanks so much for inviting me on today. I feel very honoured to be part of this belonging a set of interviews so thanks so much for that um my mum actually um she was a single parent growing um black children in london she was called of the sort of n-word lovers and mm -hmm. things like that growing up in south london um in her teens when she had me um and she was very proud to be a lover of black men actually so you couldn't really put her down in this way. Um, so I feel like she was a very smart woman, was, we lost her uh, six years ago next month. Um, and it's a real shame that she's not in this world because she is uh, has a great level of humanity. She made me understand that I would be viewed as a black woman in society. So I went out there understanding this thing and. I've never been um, out in society looking at my face. So I wasn't really overly concerned with how people responded to me. I was able to sidestep anybody or anything that was negative or didn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. I have the power of making feel, people feel good. Um, and then of course, well, maybe not of course, but then the power to avoid things that don't make me feel good or to confront them. Actually, I'm not afraid to feel a bit uncomfortable or to clarify um, rejection. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's helpful. So it's interesting, sorry, it's interesting that you said that um, she gave you the strength. In what ways would you say that she gave you that strength to kind of like just be yourself? What was it that she kind of like instilled in you? to give you that self-confidence, to, to give you that, this is me, approach. From home, of course. So at home, you were well known. Um, being, you know, being a single parent is ridiculously hard. Mm -hmm. So she uh, let us see her struggles. So we were a team at home. Home was a place where we could be ourselves, rest, uh, revitalise and review um how we wanted to be out in the world mm -hmm. um it was a place where you could express your opinions and I, I don't know you would get a mirror sometimes on your own thought processes you know an honest mm -hmm. mirror of thought processes if you were wrong you were wrong and that could be acceptable um it wasn't always made to be right and I think knowing that we had lots of friends and uh, food, food is a huge thing that helps people belong. I think our home was always an open type space. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a lot of people coming in and using our space as a sanctuary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I can't tell you exactly how that came about, but it was. And I think we were just, we were very loving. Um, we were women. So it was me, my sister, and my mom. My sister's 10 years younger than, than us. So we had this young one to, uh, to focus on. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think that also is wonderful in life to be able to make sure that you're doing the right thing by by the young ones. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had that focus. Mum worked really hard. She wasn't actually around that much. So we had a little bit of a, say a little bit, a lot of a chaotic upbringing. But through her actions and omissions, she instilled a lot of love and a lot of respect. That that was what I think helped uh, have a sense of belonging. You knew that you had to respect everybody. And with that, you could absolutely expect to be respected. So you kind of walked around with that, um, with the understanding that not everybody's really going to be doing that. In fact, most people aren't going to be doing that. That was the understanding. And we didn't mind people not being pleasant. We just avoided them. It sounds to me that your mum instilled this work ethic in you, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that, and, and also, I don't want to call it um, a siege mentality, but it was, we are the team. Right. right. Yeah, right. we are the team, right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says out there, we are the team. So Yeah, and we, we got this, and we're having fun. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we like the idea that we used to sort of always sort of talk about. You know, if there was a video or if we could get recorded before we could record it, that we might get locked up because we're so crazy and fun. <laughs> you know, so open and fun. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And I and I know now as a as a grown up when you're living it, it's not so easy to, to define what it is. But as a grown up, I understand that we were just very accepting mm-hmm. of everybody. Mm-hmm. And that instilled a uh, trust in people to to be around us. There was always people trying to be in our space. Mm-hmm. Still, to this day, people trying to be in my space, which I like. Yeah. So so it sounds to me that your mum had a, I'm going to say, an open door, a very receptive, an open-hearted approach to to people um, from all over. She, she, she was accepting of people, right? right? Yeah, and and that's what she's instilled in yourself, to be accepting of, of, of what other people say. And, and well, to, yourself, of course, in the first the, instance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how did that translate when you were at school and um, growing up? What what did that translate to? How, how did you find school? Were people- it's so funny. Accepting of you, kind of thing. It's so funny that um, you're talking about these things now. As again, as a grown up, it sounds quite bragging. I think I was very popular in school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I was very sporting. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in all of the sports teams. Um, I was uh, in most of the top groups in. Um, the, the different subjects. So I had a wonderful experience at school. Even, in fact, we have a quite rare group of people um, that we went to school with that we're still friends. All these many, I mean, it's decades later. Um, so school is, a, school is a great experience for me. So did they, <laughs> did they push you? What, 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 what did you want to do? What, what, what was your aspirations? Um, when you were at school? Get through it. Okay. <laughs> um, well, whilst at school, I would be going home to look after my sister, to no parents. I'd be taking her to, to school in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I had this responsibility um, at home. Um, and then I suppose, I don't think that school is necessarily freedom, but where I was thriving there and I found it easy um, to be in the space, I enjoyed it. I never, never sort of wanted to bunk or not be there. Um, so I feel like I was, I was revered. I was always the one that people would come and share. I was a confidant for many people, surprisingly for me sometimes. It kind of remains true today that I talk about I must have a face that people want to want to share their things with because I can't quite figure it out sometimes mm-hmm. why I get um, very intimate um details and stories of people without instigating this sort of conversation with um so i think i've always been an upstanding individual um 
and curious um, and trustworthy. Again, these are things that are difficult to talk about when I was younger, but as a grown woman now, I can see clearly that this is this these these are my truths, um, and I I try not to think about it too much because I do think if I figure it out, I'm going to lose these gifts, you know. Yeah. So I just kind of I like to live a little bit live. We can't rectify the past. We can't really control the future. So I like the idea of sort of sort of living live. And with regards to thinking about, you know, overcoming some of these race issues, I think that that is a very important viewpoint, is to not look to rectify the past or particularly change the future, but do do what you can right now um, and behave in ways that can make now a bit better. Loving is the word that comes to my mind. If we can behave more loving towards each other yeah. um, on any given scenario, then... Um, it's a better outcome for everybody. So, so tell me, it, it sounds clearly that you were very popular. I really like the fact that you said trustworthy, right? Because that means that although people knew that they could tell you things and it wasn't going to go around the playground or go around, you know, you, you were, were discreet about what you were doing, but yet you had their back. Okay. Yeah. Right. So who did... Who were your role models? Who, who, in when you were go, going through this, everybody's coming to you. What was it that you wanted to to gain out of life? What was it that you wanted to to develop in as a young woman, as a young black woman? I think I've always wanted to make uh, changes. I ended up becoming a personal trainer. Yeah. Um, so I've always been one to to serve, and I think these ways of being able to have these open, intimate um, conversations with people was something that I did quite naturally. I'll be honest with you. I never really thought about what I was going to become um, mm -hmm. or I, where I wanted to go when I was young. Mm -hmm. um, I liked sports and I liked science. So I started doing a sports science degree when I recognized that that was a thing. I was very excited about that being a thing. They were my favorite subjects. <laughs> Failed that. I did it for a few months and didn't, didn't finish that at like 18, 19. Um, that wasn't the time. I went then to Australia at 22 uh, months. I decided to become a midwife. Um, at like 22, I decided to go traveling for a minute, uh, 15 months, in fact. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for me, my career options, sort of, the opportunities came to me. So when I started doing my sports science degree, I decided to then get a job in sports. So I those days when you could walk into a place and go, I want a job. I walked into the gym and was like, I want to work here. And they were like, all right, jump behind the reception. <laughs> then I was like, I want to be a personal trainer. I want to be in the gym. And they were like, we have to do a little bit of work first. You know, we'll talk to you about your, uh, at your three months probation. That day I was in boss's office, three months. I was like, I'm ready for the gym now. And he was like, you're such a good receptionist, which I took offense to. Um, and I was like, well, I'm leaving. So actually they put me in the gym the next week. Um, I'd done the qualification in the meantime. So I was like, like, you know, I'm ready. So um, I went in the gym and actually they were quickly wanted me to do the personal training course. And then they were fighting for me to go to Liverpool Street or to stay in Hammersmith where I was. Um, so that was nice. I got this feedback that I was great at what I was doing. Um, so that was, I guess I always feel a little bit, shy about being so good at stuff because the other personal trainers weren't getting these options weren't getting these opportunities um but that was fine i i took it i went to liverpool street they were going to try and take me to chicago to be a personal trainer out there um i went to chicago to see if that could be true that never came to fruition actually um in the gym there were these two south african boys who came up to me at one point. I knew they were up to something because they kept making me do exercises. But I left them to it knowing they were up to something. And they came to me after a couple of weeks and they were fuming that I was the strongest pound for pound than them as well. So they then were speaking about how black people are just generally stronger and faster. Um, and although they were pleased for me, they were... 
so upset to find that my I was I used to train very smart, hard but smart. Yeah, and yeah. as personal trainers, this sports science uh, world was just like um, igniting then. So we were learning a lot about the sports science and actually using those um, methods in our personal training programs and things like that. Um, so that's what we were trying on each other. So that's where I couldn't quite figure out what they were doing to me when they were telling me to do stuff. We were all, we were always telling each other to do stuff, testing stuff out. Um, so yeah, they come up with this wonderful conclusion which I agree with that um you know black women particularly are stronger than everyone <laughs> so that was yeah that was that was a wonderful experience and it was from there I decided to train to be a midwife. But why that transition from being in the world with the personal trainers then to going into being a with what was the connection how how did that connection come about? Oh, I like telling people to push all the time. That's what it is. <laughs> Count down from 10 and push, same, same. But no, the truth is that I did um, like a prenatal, postnatal um, short course within the personal training. And I thought it was rubbish. I kept reading over it. Look, you know, when you're looking for something more. But fundamentally, it was saying to treat the women with kid gloves. Um, and I knew that wasn't that wasn't good training. It was, it was almost a waste of time. Aqua aerobics and yoga is not what most women want to do. Um, and I had greater faith in women knowing their bodies. And we're always talking about exercises for daily living or activities, ADL. When you're writing a personal training program, these are things that you want people to be strong at, their activities relevant for their daily life. So, you know, like bicep curls is, not what most people need to do. Um, so body weight exercises have always been in there, your squats, your lunges, your push-ups, uh, strong back. So I kind of got to question in who I might trust if I had been pregnant. And the answer was a midwife. It transpired to be the absolute wrong answer to the question. Um, our midwifery care and our training programs dictate that actually this health and nutrition part of uh caring for our woman goes way down it's in there but it's way down the list of of conversations and actually anything that we can influence or there aren't any resources we can send our women to in 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 our society that would allow them to comfortably train mm -hmm. or do exercise i did write um my dissertation in 2010 um and it was titled midwives advocating exercise in pregnancy so there's a number of layers um about why there, there are obstacles to to women accessing or agreeing to or society in general thinking that it's a good idea one of the big um things that i came across one of the big themes that i came across was you know the behavioral science if the whole of society disagrees uh, agrees that exercise is a bad thing it's very difficult for women to go against that mm. Mm. so it's only becoming a little bit more acceptable for really quite heavily pregnant women to be in the gyms yeah now I never really saw them you know when i was there 20 years ago so it, so it was it was that it was that moment of seeing women in the gym and then saying you know i i could i think doing midwifery would be a good thing the poor practice which you identified is is what I, I'm I'm hearing. You identified poor practice in what was being um, recommended. Yeah, I'm not sure I could say it's poor practice. It's just okay. eliminated. Okay. It's just it's just it's just eliminated from regular routine care. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a number of subjects that we need to speak to the women about, mm -hmm. and if they are not training or it's not a regular thing. Mm -hmm then the conversation can't be regularly had. So, okay, so how do you broach that 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 conversation with women then? What, what, what's, what's, what's the starting point? How, how do you um, start that discussion? And what's the benefits, would you They say? have to start the discussion, right. really, the women. Okay. Um, as a midwife, as a, I've got this whole list of um, information that I have to impart. Mm -hmm. to the women um and we do ask them about you know their smoking status talk to them about the foods that they should and shouldn't eat 
Mm-hmm. Um, but that's really about it. We don't really talk about their exercise levels. We might note down that they do something, but I don't think many midwives are confident to have conversations around what mm-hmm. exercise they should do. And sure enough, the NICE guideline stated that um, exercise is not known to harm your baby. So us clinicians don't have anything solid to be able to share. We have to work in um, evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. And there isn't an evidence base, um, believe it or not, for women exercising in pregnancy. It is getting better. There is more research now out there. um, And that has shifted a little bit in society. But it's always our um, more affluent women that will continue and that's the recommendation. You can continue doing what you were doing before pregnancy. So if you were regular in the gym before, that's very good of you to remain a regular gym user afterwards. Of course, not doing any sort of rock climbing or horse riding, anything that can make you fall on your bum. And then, of course, if you weren't exercising before, the recommendation is exactly the same as everybody else. Accumulate the 30 minutes of exercise on most days of the week. So that is what the whole of society should be doing, pregnant or not. Um, this isn't, I would like this to be given to the women every time, but again, if they start asking more questions, then if a midwife isn't confident in sharing um, her knowledge, if she doesn't have any knowledge, then we're not going to, we're not going to make any impact. I'll always encourage the women to exercise. If they tell me they're training and things, I'll talk to them about it, fully encourage them. Sure enough, the other day there was, I had a antenatal um, checkup with a 34 weeker and she was saying to me that she had some hip pains and things like that and when I mentioned sort of perhaps going to aqua aerobics or um, doing some yoga two things I've dismissed but for the uh, pelvic pain of course it's the it would be very helpful and she was quite heavy at 34 weeks and she just was a marvelous idea yeah and I will see her next week and I look forward to hearing about how she's had these moments of, of relief in the water. She was going that afternoon, she was telling me. Yeah. So, so advocating for it made her go, just me having it in my bag of tricks, as it were. And I'm not sure that many midwives would readily recommend that very, it's a very simple, wonderful thing to encourage a woman to do. Mm-hmm. So, so, it's, so it's part of, so with, within your training as a midwife, was any of this, any of these ideas expelled, kind of like promoted, other than them saying, continue doing what you were doing before or do regular exercise? Was there anything else to support that during your training programme? No. No. So it's, it's like the idea of awareness, because... The whole idea of what you said, it was just bringing that awareness to the lady to say, you know what, have you thought about doing this? And that then was something which, and hopefully next week you'll find out how well that has has worked out for her. So, so, so yeah, I, I, I like that. There's always, in your experience, um, as a black woman, because I always hear in the news about differential outcomes for black women compared to white women in in pregnancy we see the statistics in your experience what's it been like what is it like yeah this this is um this has remained the same um numbers since i started to um train as a midwife in 2006 Mm-hmm. We learnt about Embrace and the CMACE reports, so the Confidential Inquiries for Child and Maternal Health. Um, and there's a threefold. So, so we we do the numbers in one hundred thousands. So we talk about, and it's thirty five black women in one hundred thousand pregnancies that will have a negative outcome. We're talking about dying here. Mm-hmm. Um, and interestingly. It's black, white, Asian, Chinese, and then mixed numbers. And I actually have written them down because I wanted to talk about this subject. So black is 35 women in 100,000, um, which is three times as much as the white at 12 women at 100,000. The Asian women are at 20 per 100,000. 
they've separated the Chinese women in our in our numbers. And there are eight, so they're the the most safe mm -hmm. population in our country. At, um, eight in one hundred thousand women will die, and then there's mixed, mm -hmm. which um is always uh is sixteen sixteen per one hundred thousand. So mix is also the bit of the controversial one because you know someone could be, I don't know, Polish and Chinese, mm -hmm. um, for example. But you know it tallies up to hot mixed black Asian are twice as likely to die in childbirth than their white or Chinese counterparts, and this hasn't changed. Um, I think that. One of the things that hurts my heart the most is an understanding of a few stories of black women, really intelligent, successful career women that I know personally um, have been treated very poorly, very racistly, is that a word? Is now <laughs> by their black counterparts. By their black counterparts on the ward. Right. Right. So black on black right. racism within the NHS. Right. I have um, an example. I, I, I have at least six examples. So I've been working in preterm birth research for the last, it's been 10 years, 12 years, in fact, 10 years on this project that involved recruiting women living with HIV um, around the University Hospitals of London. So I worked out of 10 hospitals. So before COVID, I was going to these hospitals and I was seeing these women myself five times during their pregnancy. And I had the honour and privilege of being able to go and get my postnatal sample from these women in their homes. So, of course, we developed a beautiful relationships, beautiful professional relationships. Um, and I wasn't deliberately asking these women about their experience, but I always ask women when I see them with their new babies, did, did we treat you well? I find myself throughout my career apologizing a lot for the NHS and I just need the women to feel okay. So I I choose to always apologize if I hear they've had a terrible treatment from midwives. I just apologize for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been, yeah, it's, it's been really, really telling when you ask this question, did we treat you okay? Um, and they come up with some really troubling scenarios, actually. Um, there's one of our women that was in NHS. She was a consultant, she's a consultant, actually. Um, and she's Muslim and she wears a hijab. And, you know, she'd had many babies at that point. And she, only in this last pregnancy, did she choose to tell her caregivers that she was consultant before that she hadn't and I'd encouraged her to do so this pregnancy I mean I looked after her so she didn't need to tell anyone it was fine but um she she yeah she'd been treated really terribly because people had assumed I don't know what they'd assumed but they hadn't been pleasant and they were black you're disturbed yeah I'm just I'm just letting that sink in. I'm letting that sink in for a minute because you would have thought that you'd have thought that you would have got a higher standard of care. You would have an equal standard of care, you know. Um and so that in itself is is very worrying. And you will never be able to know exactly why it was that they um, felt that they were treated in a worse way from another uh, another black midwife from a black midwife. Well, I answered the question. This there were there were there were three stories that I've had this past this twenty twenty four, and um, I had other experiences of of last year. I was deliberately recru recruiting black pregnant women mm -hmm. without HIV mm -hmm. um, in order to solidify my science. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we'd already published um, our findings. Um, so we were looking at molecular markers for preterm birth, so deep science we were in. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and most of our controls had been white women, which mm -hmm. meant that our science couldn't really be compared. So we needed to rectify that by recruiting black women without HIV so we could do the comparisons. Mm -hmm. So the forefront of my mind was um, trying to get to recruit more black women. I was learning mm -hmm. then that this is an issue. I hadn't really thought about it because I was always just approaching pregnant people to try and come into my trial. Um, and I was asking the midwives um, to help me out and reminding them of these statistics, actually, in one of my emails, I felt like, you know, prodding um, or poking a response, saying we really need to recruit some black women so we can look to um, understand preterm birth, more preterm birth theme um, is known to affect black and Asian women more. Um, and why is something that we're also trying to trying to tease out here. So with these thoughts in my mind, I was answering the three stories that I got this year, uh, what they think it is. And the women each said straight up racism, just, just straight up bad treatment for no logical reason mm -hmm. apart from mm -hmm. the colour of their skin. Mm -hmm. And this was... For those three, those were, were those all with with black carers, or was it with with just midwives in general? They, the two scenarios were really bad with with black carers, mm -hmm. and the one um, was with a white doctor. So. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand what what could have been at the I know racism, but was there any other factors that could have influenced their treatment by these people? Do you know of any other? Or did they go into you know the stories? You're you're just kind of like recounting elements of it because when we're thinking about the patient's sense of belonging, the patient's sense of security at such a vulnerable time, right? Mm. What could it, what else could it be if it wasn't that, if that makes sense? No, I get what you're, where you're coming from. And yeah, there's personality clashes and expectations that aren't met, that upset people. Um, these, these women weren't their first babies. I think that's relevant in there, you know? Mm -hmm. Um so I'm unable to tease out anything else here. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, so, so it wasn't like it was the first time they were in, they were giving birth, delivering, right. uh, but their experience they felt um, constituted poor practice, poor behaviour, and the the idea behind that they felt was due to racism. Yes. And so the, the figures which you you kind of like um, you told us about at the start, thirty five black women in every ten thousand, hundred thousand, hundred thousand. Sorry, every hundred thousand having an adverse leading to to death. You know, those are very high, stark figures. They are very oh, high, too high. You know, yeah. What what? What would you say the community of, of midwives and medical profession are doing to um, rectify that? Because you said you started your training in 2006 right. and you said that the figures, it's now 2024. And you said that in that interim time, those figures haven't changed. No. So, so what's going on with, within the medical profession, within the training um which, <clears throat> yeah, what's happening within the medical profession, within the training, um, how come we're not seeing changes in these statistics? The NHS have always had um, a goal to close the inequalities gap. Mm -hmm. So we learnt about this when we first become clinicians. And of course, we make an oath to cause no harm and to deliver the best care we can. 
um, recognizing our actions and our omissions. It's very important that we recognize what we don't do um, as, as well as what we do do. Um, for me in midwifery, uh, things like the community centers being taken away has been a disaster. Mm -hmm. To the women, um, when I first qualified, I'd be able to talk to them about going to the mother and baby groups and things like that. The health visitor would be able to guide them there. And sure enough, they would be able to go out into community. And you had a sense of them having some support for their well-being. This isn't true anymore. Mm -hmm. There aren't the community um, centers anymore. So the other thing to understand is that the deprivation is a huge factor. So the, the difference in the outcomes for those in deprived areas and those in the affluent areas is huge as well. Uh, I did have those stats, but it's huge. The, the disparity is massive. So in order to get to our deprived areas to serve them we do need to spend money ultimately mm -hmm. we do need to put some uh, facilities and resources in place so these women can be together and actually just that togetherness is brilliant for one's mental health and hope for the future because the other thing to understand about women which is not changed as well is that the second thing and it's always been the same that 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 kills women after having babies is suicide so caring for their mental health should be absolute and top priority and of course i understand that when you exercise together this mm -hmm. sort of you know sweating and grunting together stuff um facilitates bonding you know and my imagine my uh, ideal would be to have um, to facilitate conversations around uh, diet, food. Um, this is going to this this creates inclusion. Um, I I think being a very proud Londoner, one of the things that brings us together, and one of the most fantastic reasons to be in this particular city, is the availability of the different foods through the different diverse cultures that we have here. This is a gift. So this very simple thing, if we brought the women together to talk about their issues with their children, um, to talk about how they're gonna take care of themselves and each other, um, it could be a really beautiful thing. I, I, I just spotted it, I really, I wanna, combine what you've just said with a question which just came up in the audience by Jennifer Joy and she asked the question she says I, I, um, I find the stati statistics worrying do you think that the poorer quality of care given by black Asian and minority ethnic um, care workers healthcare workers towards other um, minoritized patients could be due to the poor treatment of the black Asian and minority health workers themselves Absolutely. in the workplace. Absolutely. Hurt people hurt people. So I yeah, I think I think there's a huge, a huge element of that. When I was training to be a midwife, um I I said to one of my supervisors, you know, I, I, I'm you, you have no power. So you get to see some care that is uh, substandard. Mm -hmm. um, and in my final year, I have said to my supervisor, I, I can't cope with this anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was always a similar answer in that, you know, you get to see the practice you don't want to be or see. Um, and I'm like, I don't need to see that stuff anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she reminded me that our domestic violence statistics, which is that one in every three women are suffering domestic violence. And I share this with you because it really settled me down, thinking actually, you know, these midwives are women. Mm -hmm. So one of three of these are potentially at home, not having a nice time. So actually at work is their only freedom. I, I can't forgive or justify uh, people being mean to people but there are some 
reasons why people behave in certain ways. I don't know how to care for these people um, and help them be more loving. Mm. Um, yeah. It's, I'm just, I'm, there was another thing. Thank you. Thank you for, for that question, Jennifer. Really, really powerful question. And it kind of like also leads on to um, another point which you made about the second highest element of deaths then comes in through suicide. Okay. It's always been true, yeah. Right? So so what we're talking about, or from if I'm understanding and hearing right, is we're also thinking about how well are we coping with the mental health and well-being of women who have gone through that process of, of pregnancy and, and delivery. And, you know, it's a big life-changing experience, you know, it really is. So what is the NHS doing in terms of training, in terms of looking at these things? There's two things here which I, I find really very worrying. What 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 measures are in place to to support to ensure better practice um going forward? I'm not sure. The issue remains around the um, deficit of midwives. There's not enough of us in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can't forget the pandemic here when we're talking about service provision of the NHS. Mm -hmm. That's done t terrible things um, for the clinicians in the NHS. It's, it's, it's hard mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know if we need to look after ourselves in terms of clinicians, if we need to build that bond back and that trust um, and motivation in order to best serve our communities. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not looking for you to have an answer, to be honest, because it's, a, as you said, before you were, before you even started training as a midwife, these problems have existed, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're in the, the thick of it, as as it were, these problems are still here. So I suppose part of it's how we help to develop, how society helps to develop best, better practices. Um, but that's gonna be on society to be advocating and pushing forward for better provisions. And as you said, there's a deficit of midwives. We have to take into consideration also the impacts that COVID had on has had has had on the medical profession. Yes. Um, and even just this week there we was don't forget that. Yeah. I, and I don't think we and I think some people some people may not have been affected as such. And by that I mean they weren't on the front line, right? Yeah. They weren't on the front line. They didn't see it. So they didn't see the impact that it was having. And so therefore, they're almost immune um, or oblivious to what our health care went through um, and what the people have gone through. A but lot of our frontline workers moved away from home to be able to practice in the pandemic. Yeah. People committed. They were committed to serving our societies. So do you think there that... is a lot of will out there? Yeah. There is. I mean, I, I have faith. I have faith in humanity. I do. Um, but if you've been, you know, if you've been pounded and pounded and pounded and had your goodness dragged out of you a bit mm -hmm. and then sort of forgotten about and asked to sort of get back on with it. Yeah. There isn't any going back. There needs to be a different forward. There needs to be a different future. And I wish that everybody, I mean, we're Londoners, right? Whether you were born here or you're here, you're living here, you're working here, we're Londoners. I'm a very proud born and bred Londoner. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a really beautiful opportunity to, to fold into your humanity because the options of getting to know different sorts of diverse cultures mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is a gift here. Mm -hmm. London provides that. Mm -hmm. Um and if you're not interested in people, then perhaps perhaps go to an island where there are no people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, fold in and, and enjoy. And I, I I want 
I want people to have a look at their own bias and understand that it's okay to have strong uh, opinions, emotions about people um, for a variety of reasons. And if you know that you have these strong emotions um, about these people, perhaps then you can man manage how that manifests in your behaviors. We need to be very mindful about what we're thinking about when we talk to people. And in our professional capacity, I don't think there's any space for anyone to be anything other than the best practitioner they can be. Mm. You know, you, 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 you've sparked some real thinking for me anyhow, in, in the way that you've described those the experiences and I think a lot of people are still in a although we lived through the pandemic the pandemic was was different for all of us yes. and I wondered to myself whether or not um because we haven't seen the extent of suffering not firsthand it's different to see it on the news but when you're when when you're there in the hospitals and and going through all of those experiences and it's in your work environment that that has must be exhausting both yeah. physically mentally emotionally and i i wonder have we given space enough for healing and not just not just physical healing the mental healing that these scars of the, it's almost like post-traumatic stress syndrome i think so yeah you know have, have we really considered as a society what it is that with the medical profession yeah that they are going through a post-traumatic stress and how do we we help support um the society to, to move on it's a good question I, I don't know. I don't have the answers. I really don't. But I really am very thankful for you to highlighting that. So I'm going to, I'm just wary of time. So I'm going to go to my final two questions. Because I think you've, you've given a really, you've given me a lot of food for thought. That's Good. what I like. You've given me a lot of food. And I'm hoping the, view, the, the viewers as well will agree that it's a lot of food for thought. Um. Tell me what it was. What what my final two questions are. Um, what advice would you have given to your younger self? Would be one. And the second part of the question is, what do you think your younger self would look at you now and say, "Wow." Um, the advice I would give my younger self. Uh, would be to worry less and commit to more. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, my younger self looking at, at me now, I think that uh, I'd, I'd be impressed with myself. I'm the only person in my family that, I, and not just because of this, but mostly because of, of the educational attainments. Mm -hmm. I managed to get my master's through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And... Um, none of my close friends or none of my family um yeah and most of my friends don't have um high levels of of educational achievements mm -hmm. um so that again was they were opportunities that I kind of took so as I went along my career you kind of you know keep turning up and showing up and trying mm -hmm. um yeah. is probably the advice that I'd give my younger self because that is what I've done Mm -hmm. um and that has worked out for me and also I'm horrified to learn as a grown-up that listening is an actual skill I have always had that skill mm -hmm. and now I can give it to myself as a as an actual skill because yeah. I'm really good at it um and yeah just keep listening and learning um and I don't know there's something about be the change you want to be mm -hmm. you know I don't, I don't mind um wholly being rejected or anything like that it's not a big deal for me I'm not I'm thick-skinned I'm yeah. not easily yeah. offended I'm not trying to offend or be offended particularly but when we start talking about 
um, standing up for the vulnerable, all and every single one of vulnerable people in the world. I mean, we're all human, we're all vulnerable, right? But um, the particular groups, my my women, um, I have a lot of strength and time mm-hmm. and will um, to stand up and, 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 I don't know, maybe be the change that I'd like to see. Fantastic. I, I wanted to just, just I, I know I said that there was my final two questions, but there was something which I did ask you earlier on in the week, and I'm going to, because you said when, when I asked the question about what would your younger self look at you now and say, wow, right? And the thing that you went to was your educational achievement, right? And you've got your your master's. And I quizzed you in the week, and I'm going to quiz you again. What about going for the PhD, right? Because yeah. I, I, the, the way in which you have, the way in which you have articulated yourself and you have posed those kinds of in the the questions the inquiry of those questions and getting people to think about um the data and the information in a different way that's what i believe doing a phd is all about and i can see i could see that kind of drive that you have would be such a valuable asset so or I'm going to just leave it there. Like, <laughs> I'm going to leave it there, right? And thank so you. And that, that I believe that you should be go. You should be considering going for a PhD. I'm not going to. I'm not saying the road is easy. It's there. It's there. I, it's in the background. It's I'm there. Not, <laughs> not, <laughs> right? Sorry, but I I I see that you have all the attributes and so much more. Thank you. Able to do that and go and really drive those questions, which I think are are, are kind of that fire in your belly because you want those questions answered. Mm. Well, I want to do more. I want to action. I'm an action type girl. So I want to do this inequalities thing. I was looking to perhaps go to somewhere. I looked up all of the most deprived areas around South England. I didn't want to be too far away from West London, where I live. Um, Luton is a very deprived area. So I kind of wanted to perhaps do some exercise in pregnancy there, see if I can make these deprived populations healthier and see if we could influence their outcomes for the better, just with togetherness. So the togetherness would be exercise or not exercise, a little bit of education. And then the sort of overarching idea is to get a group of women to kind of tell me how they best wanted to be cared for and, and do that. So a proper patient orientated um, routine care plan um, for these women. So yeah, I'm I'm not letting the PH go, PhD go, Wayne. I just <laughs> I said to you, I need to do it my way. That's right. That's or it. the highway, that's <laughs> what we've got going on. <laughs> Right, listen, you know, I'm here to support you. Really am. You if, you, if you choose to go down that way, or whichever way you go, because I think the ideas that you have are so important that they need to be addressed. Whichever way, they need to be addressed and they need to be recognised. So I, I think just it's the timing. The yeah. COVID. I mean, I choose not to forget the pandemic. I think yeah. it affected so many people for so long, and I. It helps me forgive people as well who are not behaving nicely yeah um so i i think that off the back of that we do have an opportunity to carve out a better way mm-hmm. some people just need I, I found that a lot of people just want to be heard following the pandemic there's a lot of whinging going on people have got stuff they need to need to get off the chest yeah right uh, and I'm 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 hearing it, and I'm I'm happy to kind of I don't know. They say a problem shared is a problem halved, and I I have I have faith in that. So perhaps if more of us want to be mindful of actually putting what we're feeling on the table, with the idea actually of not just plonking it down like a stinky piece of something, mm-hmm. but actually sort of playing with it and, and and making it something better that we can move forward with, because the dumping is not really the way forward. Yeah, we need yeah. to be mindful of each other in this um, in these conversations. I think. 
I know I said I know I said it was my last question, right? Yeah. Every time you say something, something then twigs in my mind. So now this is I I I, I am saying this is going to be the last one. You're going to promise. Go on. I'm, I'm going to try and promise. Who supports you? Because I'm I'm looking at your role, right? In the way that you support women through that that time, that that sensitive time, that time of of giving birth and you support them and you've looked at other ways that you want to support the community etc but who's supporting you who's helping that's a very very good and poignant question um i've always been the head support as it were in my family when mom was around and i guess um i guess no one actually I take what I do from my friends. I do my, I, I, I practice what I preach. I'm known through my friends. So I don't ever particularly hold on to masses amounts of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm known because I, I, I have these conversations with my very dear friends. So there's, there's, there's four women in my world, um, including my sister, who I um, are witnesses to my life. So nobody has ever truly... Um, taking care of me it's always been me yeah and I don't as I say I'm grown up I've never truly recognized this until I lost my mum six years ago I was also her yeah. care giver yeah. Um, yeah so yeah no one that sounds really sad doesn't it but I didn't realize that until I've, I've lived my whole life not thinking that that was needed I'm mad. I'm now more needy of support than I've ever been, but I, I just like feeling nice and people bring a lot of crap that I dismiss. <laughs> but you know, you actually did for support where you said you've got those four women in your life and you, right. it's understanding that they provide you with what you need to yeah. give you that sense of belonging, that sense of who you are. They're, very strong sensibility yeah, yeah. yeah you're right get enough of each other that's that's the point it's, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful they've been around my whole life these women yeah. since my teens um obviously my sister yeah forever um and i value them greatly um and with that so i have a couple of um boys that i grew up with when i was like 14 and they're all very interested and curious i have a huge diverse range of this these people I'm talking about, they're from different backgrounds, cultures, accents, some of them. Um, and the, the thread that rings through them is that they are upstanding, um, slightly nuts individuals um, who are fun and wish to be known. They want to know and they wish to be known. So I have this always beautiful touch on uh, good humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah, so my faith remains strong. Mm -hmm. always and should I need something I could go and answer these people yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know maybe I'm glad I'm not so such a my needs aren't great I need food most of the time <laughs> all sorts of different and music and then uh to be nosy about what people's lives are like yeah. and, to share yeah. mine. and I get that in abundance so fantastic thank you Rachel it's been an absolute pleasure having this conversation of really mine too it. um and yeah there's so much insight and as i said i'm gonna be hounding you i think well whatever no not hounding is the wrong word do it <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be there for you to to whenever you want to either do a phd or whatever research ideas because you've got a lot of ideas and i think they've got some real good for want of a better word they've got some real good legs right yeah yeah, thank you. <laughs> right. right. It's thank timely, you. I think, as well, yeah. for me to yeah. do this stuff. Yeah. So, so I appreciate that. Let's, let's work on that. All right. Yeah. Yes. I'm oh. saying yes. Okay, let's do this, right? <laughs> you heard it here first, people. You heard it here first. Oh, no pressure. <laughs> but I've got, I know my pressure. I could say that too, didn't I? Yep. So true. Right. So, thank so much for your time. It's been great. Thank you. I'm gonna just share with everyone what we're gonna what's gonna be next week. Um let's see. Next week we're going to have Olo Yobi Kobla 
um, Baba Ola, who is a Nigerian and South African professor of agriculture um, um, for the African um, Academy of Science. Um, and she's also one of the Provost Visiting Professors um, of Soil and Plant Microbes here at Imperial. So she's going to be our guest next week. She's also a trailblazer in her own what right. Um, and so please join us for that as we again explore um, reclaiming narratives as part of Black History Month. And then if you have missed any of the other um, interviews which we've done, please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. And I'm going to plug my book again, or, or one of our book, um, which is the Black PhD Experience, Strength, Courage and Wisdom in the UK Academy. It's out. Um, please order. We are having a book um, launch on the 21st of October. So if you'd like to attend that, please go to Eventbrite and you'll be able to sign up. And if not, we'll we'll find another venue for you to come and have a discussion with some wonderful PhD, well, doctors now, right? So what I want to say is, again, thank everybody who has contributed. Thank Rachel for her contribution today, for giving us an insight of what it is and what it means to gain that sense of identity and sense of belonging. So until next week, thank everyone very much. And I will see you again next week. Thank you.